is Jim Leeming with AFL Highlights, the only show on television that gives you all the big plays from every American Football League game. Watch with us as Oakland moves closer to the top in the West by beating Denver. Boston and Kansas City battle to a tie. Joe Namath throws four touchdown passes to lead New York to victory over Houston. And for our feature, we'll profile the league champion Buffalo Bills and have an exclusive interview with Bills coach Lou Saban. The Oakland Raiders, only a game and a half behind San Diego in the Western Division, try to make up some ground over the idle Chargers against the Denver Broncos at Bear Stadium in Denver. Tom Flores puts the white-shirted Raiders on the touchdown trail late in the first quarter. Flores throws a swing pass to Alan Miller and the Raider fullback garners eight yards. On a nicely executed draw play, Alan Miller takes off on an eight-yard trip to the Raiders 32 as the first quarter comes to an end. Tom Flores opens the second period of play by passing to Ken Herrick for 13 yards as the Raider drive carries into the Bronco Corral. Flores is finding the airways to his liking. The five-year pro veteran makes a 13-yard connection with Art Powell. Flores uncorks his ninth scoring toss of the season as he spears Clem Daniels with a 34-yard touchdown bomb. The Raiders get on the scoreboard first for a 7-0 lead. An interception gives the Raiders another scoring opportunity later in the quarter. Tom Flores cashes in on the break by pegging a pass to Art Powell for the counter. Oakland assumes a 14-0 advantage. John McCormick finally gets his Broncos on track following the kickoff. Lionel Taylor latches on to McCormick's pass for 12 yards. Broncos stampede into Raider country as McCormick fires a bullet to Urit Dixon. The speedy Denver end sets sail for the end zone and only a desperation tackle by Howie Williams saves the touchdown. It's a 59-yard gain. McCormick goes to his favorite receiver on the next play. Lionel Taylor makes the grab before going out of bounds on the Oakland two. Our ground level camera caught that last play, so let's take another look. Taylor, the league's top receiver, makes a nice fake on Dave Grayson and takes the pass for a first down. Wendell Hayes smashes over from there and Denver makes the halftime scoreboard read. Raiders 14, Broncos seven. Broncos stampede for more midway through the third period. John McCormick throws over the middle to Urit Dixon for 10 yards. A 15-yard penalty moves the ball to the Oakland 22. Cookie Gilchrist gets to the 15 before a nice tackle by John Williamson brings him down. John McCormick drops back and aims a pass toward the corner of the end zone. The pass has touchdown written all over it, but Bob Scarpetto can't hang on. McCormick gets the touchdown this time. Lionel Taylor latches on for his fourth scoring catch of the year, and the game is all tied at 14-14. Mikey Dick Wood takes over the Raider controls late in the period. Wood hits rookie Fred Bolitnikoff for 13 yards. Wood stays with the Raider rookie, and this time the duo clicks for a first down on the Denver 36. Drive stall, so Mike Mercer attempts a 42-yard field goal. The kick has the distance, but not the direction, and it's no good. It remains a 14-14 game after three quarters. The Broncos are in punt formation early in the final period. Bob Scarpetto catches the Raider defense napping and takes off on a 27-yard sprint to the Denver 45, where it's first down Broncos. Cookie Gilchrist gets loose, and before the Raiders can catch up, Cookie Bulls for 19 yards. But the officials call Denver for clipping, and the gain is nullified. John McCormick makes up the yards lost by the penalty, and more, as he hits Lionel Taylor on the Oakland 35. 
Bronco bid for the go-ahead points goes up in smoke as McCormick's pass is picked off by Oakland linebacker Gus Otto. The Raider rookie rockets back the other way for 68 yards and a touchdown. Oakland takes the lead, 21-14. The Broncos charge back following the kickoff. John McCormick finds Lionel Taylor with a 23-yard strike to put the ball near midfield. Once again, the alert Raider defense rises to the occasion. Dave Grayson swipes a screen pass intended for Cookie Gilchrist and heads for the end zone. Grayson makes it look easy as he scores on a 47-yard return that boosts Oakland into a 28-14 advantage. Jackie Lee takes over the Bronco reins and has better luck. Bob Scarpetto makes the grab for 13 yards. Fighting the clock, Lee must throw on every play. His pass over the middle is taken beautifully by Scarpetto on the Oakland 40. The Raider blitz doesn't affect the passing accuracy of Lee as he connects with Lionel Taylor slanting across the middle. Taylor's fancy footwork adds some more yardage on the play. Lee keeps throwing and the Broncos keep moving. Abner Haynes takes this one and makes tracks to the Oakland eight yard line where it's goal to go. Jackie Lee throws his ninth pass of the drive. This one to Lionel Taylor and it spells touchdown for Denver. But it's not enough as Oakland picks up ground on the idle San Diego Chargers in the Western Division title race with a 28 to 20 victory over Denver. The Kansas City Chiefs try to stay alive in the hectic Western Division race as they meet the ever-dangerous Boston Patriots. The Chiefs are only a game and a half from the top in the West and need a victory at Boston to gain ground on the idle San Diego Chargers. It'll be superior ground power versus the passing of Boston's Babe Pirelli. Kansas City's Mike comes to the floor early in the first quarter. The Chiefs' top ground gainer, Curtis McClinton, slashes and smashes for 15 yards. Quarterback Len Dawson avails himself of the airtight protection and pitches a strike to Mac Lee Hill. First down Chiefs on the Boston 36. KC continues to punish the Patriots. On a draw play, Curtis McClinton dodges artfully and roars away for 32 yards. But Don Webb streaks in to force a fumble, ending the Chiefs' goalward serve. Boston recovers on its own one-yard line. Hey, Brelly proves how daring a passer he can be. The ageless veteran passing out of the end zone connects with Gino Capaletti on a down and out pattern for 19 yards. The Chiefs apply a little pressure, but it doesn't hinder Pirelli as he hits Jim Nance with a pass. The former Syracuse great doesn't stop there. Raw bone power and drive come into the play as Jim bolts to a gain of 22 yards. On first and ten at the Kansas City 39, Pirelli stepped back and lost a towering toss to the streaking Jim Colclaw. But Fred Williamson performs the way a defensive back should, intercepting Pirelli's pass on the three. The first quarter ends with neither side able to score. The Patriots launch an assault following a missed field goal by Kansas City in the second quarter. Pirelli sends one of his aerial rockets to Jim Colclaw. A spectacular catch by Colclaw, and that's 41 yards for Boston. Pirelli keeps the defense guessing by handing off to J.D. Garrett. The sensational soft is tripped after a first down carry for the Chiefs 27. When the drive runs out of gas, Gino Capaletti slams home a 17-yard field goal, and the Patriots lead 3 to nothing. Following the kickoff, Len Dawson tries to rally his forces. Dawson sends a floater angling toward the sideline, where it's caught sensationally by Chris Burford for a 29-yard pickup. Patriots blitz, but the veteran passer avoids the rush and gets the pass away. On the other end is Frank Jackson, who grabs hold for a gain of 20 yards to the Boston 14. Dawson's picking the Patriots secondary to shreds with his precise tosses. Chris Burford latches onto this one. The slow motion camera highlights the great protection Dawson receives as he dances back and launches a pass goalward. 
Chris Burford, who would make a good second story man, leaps high to grab the toss for a touchdown. That completes the scoring in the first half as Kansas City forges ahead to take a 7-3 edge into the third quarter. It's touch and go until Kansas City gets a big lift from this Len Dawson cross-country pass to Chris Burford. Burford makes another unbelievable catch as he nears the 120-yard mark in this game. Dawson's having a terrific day, too. Len hits Frank Jackson with a look-in pass to keep the drive in high gear. Relying solely on the pass, Kansas City goes for broke. But it's Boston that comes up smelling like a rose. Dawson overshoots the mark, and Jay Cunningham intercepts on the two. The rookie defender battles hard to return the ball six yards. The third quarter ends with Kansas City still on top, seven to three. The Chiefs want this game badly, and Len Dawson has a hot hand. The powerful ground game takes a back seat to the aerial barrage as Dawson passes to Fred Urbanis for 15 yards. Dawson calls on his other wingman, Chris Burford, and hits him with a first down pass. Burford ends up a casualty in the game and is out for the season. Boston stymies the big rush, but Tommy Brooker salvages three points with a field goal. Kansas City has a little leeway at 10-3 over the Patriots. The Pats have played a whale of a game, and it's not over yet. Rally Spears, Jim Coltlaw, who turns on his heels and tears to the KC 46. Let's watch the play again on the isolated camera. Coltlaw makes the grab and fakes his defender out of his shoes as he picks up the first down. Rally changes partners this time. Jim Whalen breaks into the clear and the Bay spots him with a pass. Whalen wheels and deals for a gain of 28 yards as the Patriots threaten. On the next play, Burley crosses up the defense completely as he hits J.D. Garrett with a swing pass. Garrett races into the end zone untouched to pull the Patriots into a tie with the Chiefs. Kansas City can't snap the 10-10 deadlock in the final minutes, and Boston jolts the Chiefs' Western title chances. Buffalo Bills, champions of the American Football League, are marching toward another division title despite injuries that have wiped out their number one pass-catching combination of Albert DeBinion and Glenn Bass. We asked Bills coach Lou Saban how he compensated for this tremendous blow to Buffalo's fierce attack. You know, every ball club goes through a routine of perhaps uh, making several changes, and we've had to do that since we've had our receiver core pretty badly banged up during the process of the season. When we lost to Bunyan and Bass, we realized we lost two of our key men as far as our ball club is concerned. And I'm very much concerned with the fact that in professional football, you got to throw to be a consistent winner. We had to make some changes and make them fast. We went ahead and made a trade for Bo Roberson, and Bo is feeling very fine for us. Still, uh, there's a case whereby the quarterbacks have got to adjust themselves to a new receiver. We made a change at our tight end position. We put call Paul Costa at this particular spot. And Paul, as a rookie, still makes some occasional mistake, but has done a fine job for us. Now, Charles Ferguson, who has been with us for a couple of years, he's been on our taxi squad, had to fill in our split end spot for Glenn Bass. Now, these three men are completely new to our receivers to a great extent. And it takes our quarterbacks a little more time to get adjusted to their maneuvers, their patterns, and their routes. Now, this is what we've had to do. To have lost as many good men as we have, I think we're quite fortunate. I only hope that uh, we can go ahead and make some adjustments here and see if we can continue to go on and win. Albert DeBinion is regarded as the fastest man in pro football, and his credentials as a receiver are equally impeccable. Last season, DeBinion averaged a record 27 yards on 42 receptions. Today, DeBinion and Bass sit on the sideline, hoping for the day when they can return to action. The Bills' offense was laboring without its two fine deep receivers, but quarterback Jackie Kemp never let the situation get out of hand. And the insertion of 256-pound Paul Costa at the split end position was a lifesaver. Bo Roberson was acquired from the Oakland Raiders to fill DeBinion's shoes at the flanker post. Upon assuming the role of the deep scoring threat, Roberson became Jackie Kemp's prime target with Costa, the short receiver. 
speed boy like Robertson makes the defenses play on it. Charlie Ferguson is the Bills' tight end. At 224 pounds, Ferguson is big enough to handle this assignment as well as any deep receiver in the league. Charlie uses his height and speed to score six points on the highly rated Kansas City defense. Buffalo's stingy defense has allowed the fewest points of any team in the league. The linebacking core is led by Mike Stratton. Stratton blitzes and Boston's Eddie Wilson eats the ball. Left side linebacker John Tracy, one of the league's deadliest open field tacklers, is equally adept at destroying pass patterns. We circle Tracy as he squashes a Denver drive by batting away a crucial third down toss. The tough no quarter given play by middle linebacker Harry Jacobs has endeared him to Buffalo fans, if not the rest of the league. Let's run the play again on the Bills' baby-faced assassin. We circle Jacobs as he prepares to lower the boom on Denver's Abner Haynes. As a rookie in 1964, Butch Bird won recognition as an outstanding all-star cornerback. Bird has maintained this high level of performance and continues to be a scourge to enemy passers. Pete Beathard tosses and Bird intercepts to kill a Kansas City uprising. Butch is also Buffalo's chief punt return artist. Jolly Warner plays left cornerback for the Bills. Jolly specially is returning kickoffs for long games. Warner's longest came at the expense of the Boston Patriots. Jolly takes Justin Canelli's kick two yards deep in the end zone. Jolly hits full speed in two strides, gets some great blocking in the thick of the heavy traffic, and he's in the clear. Patriots give chase, but nobody's going to catch Charlie on this one. It's 102 yards and a touchdown. Buffalo's main scoring threat is its soccer-style kicker, Pete Gogolak. Gogolak has been perfect on 23 conversion attempts and has booted 19 of 32 field goals for a league high of 80 points. Gogolak has been the salvation of many a stall drive. In Ray Carlton, the Bills possess one of the most underrated ball carriers in the league. In a ding-dong battle with the Denver Broncos, Carlton displays his speed and moves as he carves out a 20-yard gain. Carlton's among the league's top 10 ground gainers. The most explosive runner in the Buffalo stable is Billy Joe. Joe's speed is unquestioned. The 236-pound fullback can go all the way at any time. A smack-over type Joe is a double barrel threat as a talented pass receiver. You have just seen the Buffalo Bills stampeding to glory in the Eastern Division. It appears that Lou Saban has produced another championship outfit. Shea Stadium in New York City is the battleground for the AFL's Eastern Division fight for second place. The Houston Oilers, present holders of the runner-up spot, battled the New York Jets, the league's hottest team, with three straight victories. With the first quarter only seconds old, the green-shirted Jets come alive. Bill Mathis works the draw play to perfection as he runs for daylight. The 220-pound halfback gallops for 79 yards before he's caught from behind. The Jets are on fire. Rookie quarterback Joe Namath completes the swift 85-yard march with a pass to Don Maynard in the end zone. The New Yorkers light up the scoreboard in a hurry to lead 7-0. Late in the period, the Jets blast off again. Namath's pass is snared by D. Mackey, who breaks away for 47 yards into Oiler territory. But the drive stalls, and Jim Turner adds three points with an 18-yard field goal. New York takes a 10-0 lead. Don Troll mans the Houston helm. Forced to flee the pocket, Troll's hurried throw is picked off by Willie West, who returns to the Oiler 38. Moving to the second period, Joe Namath tries to capitalize on the break as the former Alabama star pinpoints George Sauer. Sauer speeds toward the corner and slips in for another New York touchdown. 
The Jets pull away, 17-0. Red Hot Jet can't seem to get enough. D. Mackey takes Davis path, 19 yards into the Oilers secondary. Our ground level camera watches Bill Mathis sweep the right side of the Houston defense for nine more. The Jets can't maintain the tarred pace and settle for a 31-yard Jim Turner field goal. That makes it 20 to nothing. The Texas Oilman finally shows signs of life as George Blanda and Charlie Frazier team up for 13 yards. Houston leads the AFL in pass offense. George Blanda shows how it's done on a 27-yard connection with Charlie Hennigan. The 16-year veteran keeps the drive alive with a 12-yard strike to Charlie Frazier. But the New York defense steps in, forcing a 23-yard field goal attempt. It's wide of the mark, and the Jets retain their 20-0 lead at halftime. Late in the third quarter, the Jets are airborne again. Joe Namath threads a 13-yard needle to Don Maynard. Let's watch Maynard on that play with our isolated camera. He runs a short sideline pattern, crossing up his oiler defender. Namath goes the other way this time. George Sauer performs the receiving chore, good for 14 yards, and the Jets are threatening. From the 22, Namath gives to Bill Mathis, who gathers interference on a wide sweep to the right. Mathis is finally pulled down seven yards short of the goal line as the quarter ends. The first play in the final period is a successful one for New York. George Sauer gets credit for the score, and the Jets up the count 27 to nothing. The Oilers try desperately to get on the scoreboard, but are foiled again. Ralph Baker intercepts George Blanda's pass and returns the ball 10 yards to the Houston 35. The interception sets the stage for Joe Namath to put his high-priced wing to work. Namath explodes a bomb to Don Maynard for another New York touchdown, making the score 34 to nothing. Houston never gives up as Don Kroll tries his hand at the aerial game. Bob McLeod gathers in the ball and charts a course down the sideline. The New Yorkers set up a roadblock, holding McLeod to 47 yards. At the Jet 26, Troll sends a quick pitch to Ode Burrell for a 15-yard gainer, and the Oilers are close to their first score of the game. Three yards short of the goal, Troll looks to pass. 23-year-old playmaker can't find anyone and scrambles in for the score. Houston finally breaks the ice and trails 34 to 7. The Oilers keep trying even though they trail by 27 points late in the game. Don Troll eludes the trap but follows his blockers down the left side, turning an apparent loss into a 14-yard gain. From the New York 13, Troll works the draw to Jack Spikes, who hammers in for another Oiler touchdown. The scoreboard now reads 34 to 14. Mike Tolliver takes over the Jet Helm. Matt Snell carries left and runs into a host of white jersey. Snell shows why he's New York's leading rusher as he reverses direction for an amazing 47-yard trip into Houston terrain. Just 28 seconds remain to be played as rookie Kern Carson tries his hand at the scoring game. Carson finds the path to pay dirt for the final touchdown of the game. The New York Jets win an easy 41-14 victory over the Houston Oilers to capture second place in the Eastern Division.